Welcome to the Canadian SME Small Business Podcast, the essential platform for insights, trends, and success stories within Canada's vibrant small and medium-sized business community. This is your host, SK. Small businesses are not just the engine of our economy. They are the heart of our communities, driving innovation, creating jobs, and enriching our local cultures. In every episode, we explore a critical aspect of this ecosystem, emphasizing the importance of supporting local enterprises for a thriving society. Today, we delve into the intricacies of integrating internationally educated health professionals into the Canadian healthcare system, the financial strategies crucial for business growth, and the role of payroll providers in ensuring compliance and accuracy. Without further ado, let's embark on this insightful journey. We are honored to welcome Henry Lukenge to the podcast today. Born in Uganda and having moved to England in the late 80s, Henry is a seasoned financial, tax and business executive with a profound journey across continents. His career began with a focus on mathematical statistics, eventually leading him to become a chartered certified accountant in the UK. Henry's exceptional skills and dedication saw him rise through the ranks at one of the big four accounting firms, ultimately transitioning into investment banking. Today, he leads a staffing company specializing in health and social care, focusing on meeting the crucial human capital needs of various healthcare sectors. Join us as we explore Henry's insights into the challenges and opportunities of staffing in the healthcare system, financial strategies for SMEs, and much more. Uh, good morning, Henry, and welcome to the Canadian SME Small Business Podcast. How are you today? Very well, sir. Thank you for having me over. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to have you here with us. Now, uh, Henry, like uh, I was going through your profile and I saw that like, you know, your father used to run one of the first indigenously owned business uh, construction company in Uganda during 1970s. And that's where you got introduced to the entrepreneurship. Like your journey from overcoming conflict in Uganda to leading a financial projects across Europe south asia and africa and now contributing significantly to canada's healthcare system is nothing short of inspiring we are eager to dive into your experiences and the impact work you are doing today every entrepreneur's path is unique and filled with its own set of challenges victories and lessons learned understanding these journeys can provide invaluable insights and inspiration for current and aspiring business owners including me Henry, could you share, could you take us through your entrepreneurial journey from your initial decision to enter the world of finance and accounting to leading a successful uh, healthcare staffing company in Canada? I think my journey is like, it's, it's like um, I'll call it um, um, a, a set of um, goals, one following another, no, not exactly um, in a straight path, but um, one leading into another inadvertently. Um my first degree was in what was in maths and statistics, right, and that was my um um sort of my initial interest as 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 a young person, right. My dad was in construction, he was in civil engineering. I went to school to do math and statistics, and the objective then was to be a surveyor, right, so I could basically get get around construction and get involved in it. But then, as fate would have it, um, uh, Idi Amin showed up, and there was so much displacement in the region. And we left Uganda, right? So I grew up around the world. And then um, um, in the early 80s, showed up in Nairobi in the Kenyan refugee camp um, right before the, the current government took over power, right? Then we moved to England. Then um, my mom got a job as a nurse, moved us all to England. Then while in England, um, um, obviously did my degree. And then um, um, around after my first degree, uh, it became apparent that um, Math as as a discipline and surveying as a job were not the things I was, I was probably going to be good at, right? And then um um obviously a bit of soul searching um and um um involvement of my like my mother and family around because um I did I did quite well in math and got a job but uh, I wasn't good at the job, right? Like I, it wasn't something that um, um I found myself happy with. But at the time, obviously, um, I'm having a lot of expectations and, and siblings who are all in the queue waiting for support, 
it was an easy call, right? But then eventually we talked through it and then um, the career and finance and accounting initially uh, opened up, right? Where the, my uncle said, look, um, are you good at numbers and people, right? If you can't do math and you don't want to be an engineer, then I think you should try accounting. But then I'd never done no accounting at all, right? So then um, my uncle in England, um, um, very nice fellow, um, he introduced me to a few people in the field and then set me up with a... Um, um, a small black owned, um, and uh, black owned like small CFM for them to show me, uh, what, the, what it took to be, um, like a CPA and stuff. Anyways, fast forward a few years later, I enrolled in, in the accounting program, was a pub student, and then, um, I ended up in a big fuck accounting firm, right? Then worked my way to the top. Um, then, um, um, um around 2004, end of 2004, yeah, um, um, sort of, I uh, sort of plateaued in my career in Europe because um, you um, start to move around and you realize you're, you're getting the same job without no pay increase or no responsibilities. Then you start to plateau. But then, um, uh, then I then I realized then that um, I had to explore opportunities outside Europe. That's when I got opportunities in Asia. I got opportunities to work in um, uh, then uh, the Eastern Bloc, uh, as they was he called, um, uh, communism. Communism broke down and they're trying to embrace um, accounting standards. Like people didn't, they've never done double into bookkeeping and all that stuff. So, so we went there to help them understand these things, right? And then, um, as fate would have it, um, I interviewed for a role, um, in Canada for a trust fund, and I got the role. So I moved over to basically help them out with their IFRS rollout, right? And then, um, at the end of two thousand and eight, um, um, basically, um, uh, after um, um, all those stages, as I went through them, um, I sort of realized that, um, um. I wasn't, I wasn't being as impactful as I, as, as I imagined I would have been in finance, right? First off, obviously, as everyone in 2008, uh, there was um, um, a, whole, a whole lot of um, like asset, mass asset, asset destruction, especially in real estate. And, and majority of people who, who paid the price for this were the poor and people of color and all that stuff. So many, many, many looked like me. Right, but then um, as um someone um who was um on the other end of the financial spectrum, uh, who was basically helping other people profit from um the government uh, bailouts, mm. right? I, it it did disturb me that those I those those that could should actually get the help are not getting it, not because um 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 not eligible, they just didn't know how to get to it. So as I was saying um for the interruption was that um. At the end of 2008, right, there was massive asset destruction in real estate um, across the world. Canada was, wasn't as affected because of the way um, financing houses is structured. You've got CMHC and a few protections. So um, for, the whole, for, for the most part, Canadians um, um, only faced the crisis because of uh, the knock-on effects of, of, of other economies. But in, in Brixton, where I grew up in South London and across the states where, where, where those days um, I was quite invested in real estate and, and on the financial side, um, um, on, on the, uh, what's it called, financial product side, there, there was um, humongous asset destruction, right? Like you had bear stands collapsing, you had um, um, a lot of things. Anderson went down. So anyways, um, and then there was uh, this uh, uh, global uh, movement mm -hmm to cut humongous checks for people who had made mistakes, mm. right? But as the checks were written, uh, not many ended up on the street, mm -hmm. right? So people who got who uh, sold bad products that they don't, they're not careful enough to read are going to pay the price for those who profited from it. Right. So um, as having been um, sort of um, an integral part of, of, of the system, um, reflecting on it, uh, I thought that, okay, um, I didn't believe that's where I had to be going forward, and I had to um, sort of ask myself what, what it what it is I was going to do with myself, okay. right? So then, um, 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 upon reflection, I choose I choose to walk out of finance and think about something else. No. So, um, so I I traveled the world a bit. I I did uh, got a directly would drive through India uh, with a few friends of mine. I also did I also did um, um, a road trip between Arabia and Cape Town. Uh, while trying to think about uh, what to do, and then put my house uh, in the beaches on sale, and then um, um, obviously spoke to a few people whose opinions I value, especially my mum, uh, friends in England, and then I said, okay, uh, what do you guys imagine would be an opportunity outside finance? Obviously, um, everyone thought I was crazy, because um, um, at my level, 
I, I could command any pay rate to wherever I went in the world. Um, and, and they could live comfortably without having to go back and settle again. But then I had made it the point that um, finance was, was not going to be the thing I was going to do. Mm, that's good. And now reflecting on your journey, Henry, like what have uh, like what have been some of the most significant challenges you have faced, and how did you overcome them? Um, I, I uh, personally, I would say, um, um. Obviously, um, as a child, um, overcoming displacement and all that stuff was, was challenging. But I was little. Like, we overcame apartheid through, like, when uh, we went through segregated schools up in South Africa. But I was young. So the impact of these things um, didn't become apparent to me um, until when I got older and looked back at my life just a little bit, retrospect, especially after the crisis. Because I had the opportunity to... Um, Basically, travel the world, not business class, not uh, no chaperones, you know, driving around and seeing how people live, right? And then, then looking at um, 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 at every stage of my life backwards and asking myself, how was it possible for me to have got where I went, despite where I started, right? So then um, uh, the challenge then was um, um, having got to the success I'd achieved, would I be comfortable giving it all up to the flesh? Right, that's really was the biggest challenge, right? Um, and in order to overcome that, um, um, obviously, you, you, all of us um have some fears. One of them is um uh, basic needs. Can you feed yourself? You have a, you have a roof over your head. You have clothes, right? Um, and and within limits, can you achieve a few life goals? Um, if you choose a certain path, right? So um. Obviously, the first thing I did was um um cut down my expenses to the bare minimum. Right by obviously giving up a big mortgage and buying a house. That's a very, cash. very important, right? Yeah, taking control of your own finances. Yeah, right. And then obviously part of the thing is obviously managing risk. You're saying, uh, uh, in case this doesn't work out, how can do I have a fallback plan? Right, because that time I was in a work permit. Right, so at first, uh, in order to solidify my um, uh, what's it called, ability to get assistance if I needed it, needed it, I uh, had to become Canadian. Right, so I applied for my PR card. I obtained that as well while I was traveling. It came to me in the mail. Then I said, "Okay, if everything fell apart, I could still go and get some assistance and then still fight for my dream." Right, but at the same time, uh, because I cut down most of my expenses, uh, I set out to live in my live in the same building where, where my office was, was going to be, and rent went out and live at the top while I was starting out. So in the end. Um, uh, it came down to um, how long could I wait this out because um, I had literally cut down all my life expenses, right, to fit the lifestyle I'd chosen to, to, to pursue going forward. Okay. Right. Also, the fact that, um, 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 uh, like, I had come from a situation where um, I had to work best to go to school. Right. So if I failed, I'll be a failure. Was would wasn't something I even thought about, right? Because just by doing what I was going to do, I already succeeded, right? right? So, so that that's how I like like I, I that's how I look at this. Um, like with everything I do going forward now. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that today. Like Henry, in today's rapidly evolving market, uh, adaptability can be as crucial as solid business plan, right? Could you share a time when you had to pivot your business strategy to meet the market demands? Uh, yeah, we've um um over the last uh, few years, actually from the start, I I didn't know what I was doing in healthcare, right? So. Everything I set out, business plan, name it, all of it, when it hit the market, didn't measure up. So all my working capital went out, everything went out, right? Because obviously I was learning on the job, right? So then the question is, the question I asked myself was that, what was I doing wrong, right? Which was that I was trying to sell a product based on my UK eyes without considering it's the same product how it's sold and bought in Canada. Uh, in order, in order to understand that, um, I had to get myself in front of my customer, listen to them first, and then adjust what I was giving them, right, to make sure it it fits the expectations, right, right. So in order to do that, basically what I did is that initially when I started the business, I had had some with, with, with an MBA and all that stuff, start start cutting payroll checks and had all these grand plans. Then six months in, 
and we have no sales, the money is running out. So I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do, right? Let's, let's put every, all our plans on hold, right? Then make some time, right, to basically get on the road. He, talk to all the nursing homes, talk to the hospitals, talk to anyone who can, who, who can give us an audience and ask them what sort of problems they were facing with their human capital. And say, okay, if something like this came across, would you consider it? Right? And then I said, okay, I think I'm going to do as well is that as opposed to me preparing someone to go talk about my business, I'm going to go talk to the people myself first. Right? That means if, because initially I was saying, okay, we have a presentation, present our business, I do a PowerPoint presentation, give it someone to go present. Right? What I, what I then chose to do was say, you know what? No. Here's what I'm going to do. If we have um, a, a, an opportunity to present, present our product, I will go present it myself. Right? So then um, after doing that, actually I did that after a year into our business, I did that, run out of our payroll money, and I called to friends and said, look, I'm close to my first sale, but I don't know when it's going to come, but I have no payroll money. Um, if you can find me, I think it was $20,000 for 10% of my business. So I can run payroll, right? I can, I'm, I feel that it, my next call is going to be that opportunity. Right. So anyways, um, um, a few friends sort of got together for the 20 grand and gave it to me. And I did exactly that. Over my next 10 customers, I went and spoke to them, done a presentation. And then I, I sort of gave them, presented to them why um, they should, believe in us to provide that solution. Right. And one of those customers was um, an organization up in Brampton called Brampton Cullin and Community Living. They signed a contract that helped us break even. Like, let me see, like three months into that decision, we signed our first contract and broke even. So they didn't have a million dollars a year or something like that. Yeah, that's the, as you rightly said, you know, it's very important to understand the needs first, then yeah. tailor your product uh, to fulfilling those needs. And like, uh, Henry, how did you identify the need uh, for change? Like, And what steps do you take to ensure a successful transition? Like, you see, change is one of those things that I'll sort of um, like anchor that um, um, into the last three, four years, right? Um because change doesn't, it won't show up in your face to say, I'm here. Can you act on me? It doesn't. But if a business person is looking, is listening to the market, the audience, like, like in our business, I also we have like four customers. We have the people we place. Those are our customers, right? Because, okay, they work for us, but if they don't work, we have no business, right? So we have to treat them nice. That means um, if they have a car problem, can you help them out? If they have a tax problem, can you help them out? They want to buy a house, can you help them out? Uh, they want to have a sister stock somewhere in Africa, like 80% of our people are immigrants, right? In our database, now say social workers, name the immigrants. So anything, anything that affects the quality of our database affects the value of our business, right? So we've got to listen to them and say, okay, oh, oh, when they bring up a few points, how are we dealing with those? Right? Then we have to listen to our customers when they say, oh, people are coming late, or oh, the 20 is adequate, or this, that. You have to listen to those as well. Right? So as you listen into these, you start to sort of build up a bank of issues that are coming from different uh, stakeholders within, within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why uh, when COVID, COVID came, for businesses that were listening properly to their customers, it pre presented a valuable proposition that those who are not didn't profit from. And here's what I'm going to say um, uh, to sum this up. So we set out way ahead of COVID, right, to focus on difficult submarkets, right, and then um, uh, what's he called, um, um, uh, basically combined staffing with accommodation across the customer and transportation. We had that before COVID came. Now, that was because, plus training and all that stuff, that was because... Every time we spoke to our two audiences, they had the same problem, right? I'm in a small town, there's no people. I won't work in a small town because, in a small town because I, have, I have no place to stay, right? So once we combined those two and found a solution that put accommodation in a town close to our customers and our people coming in on rotation, we fixed one problem.
but God, everyone happy. Now, when COVID came, well, no one could go anywhere because no one could go anywhere. We were ahead of the curve in solving a problem. When COVID came, we just scaled it all up. So because of that, uh, we went from being a regional player to a province-wide player to now a country-wide player because um, we had a model that was functioning that when, uh, the, when the market needed uh, scaling, we were ahead of the curve. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Henry, for sharing your enterprising journey with us. Like, you know, your story is a testament to the power of resilience, adaptability, and the drive to make a positive impact in the world. Now, like, you know, like, and and you, your explanation also made us clear that your experiences have not only shaped you as a leader, but also serve as a guiding light for others in your footstep. Now, let's talk about the integrating IEHPS into the Canadian healthcare system. Uh, like uh, the integration of internationally educated nurses and the healthcare professionals into the Canadian healthcare system presents both challenges and opportunities. Henry, could you share your insights on the primary obstacles and prospects when it comes to hiring and integrating IEHPS and other allied healthcare workers in Canada? Uh, true. Um um, basically, immigration is a federal, uh, federally administered program. So the policies around it are done federally. But healthcare is a provincially regulated and administered program. Like, oh, he, every province has its own way, it does it, nurses and doctors and everything else. Because of that, every province has its own registry body for the nurses and doctors and everything else. Right? Now, the problem is this. All the provinces have different regulations when it comes to what a nurse has to do and not do to become one, right? Now, those regulations are not compatible with the immigration policy. But in order to be a nurse in Canada, you have to be an immigrant first. And immigration is driven by your qualifications. So if your qualifications can't get in the country, then you can't be a nurse in the country. So you've got people on one side trying to say, we need all these nurses. And you have the regulators having paperwork that says, unless you're here, you can't be a nurse here. So then, so you've got these incompatibilities that 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 are building a system that um was built for like four hundred years ago when um um basically you had five nurses in Canada, and now you want you want almost half your nurses come from abroad, but you don't have a system, right? That has prepared the country or the provinces for that specific solution. Right, so you find that um uh, in our business, right, like we've got people all over the place who who would jump the opportunity to come and practice nursing here, but once they look at the paperwork and the regulations involved, they consider the UK or the US, where um it's quite simple. You get your get your credential evaluated, pass the English, then you come. Let's talk about it while you're inside. But it's here; it's different. Yeah, it's different. Right, right, because your qualification as a nurse won't get you a permit to come here. No, right. Right? right, that's the, the what's he called uh, the uh, the the conflict between the regulators right. and the immigration system. Right, and there and there where your company comes into play a very important role. Right, and uh, Henry, what steps in is your company taking to streamline this process and ensure these professionals who are coming to Canada can contribute effectively to the healthcare sector? Uh, two things. One, um, um, obviously information sharing. Right. One, uh, basically. We've created um um I would say like um um like a checklist, right? That says here is all the provinces in Canada. If you're a doctor and nurse trying to go in any of these provinces, here is what they want from you, right out of the gate. So as you start, you know you know what the road looks like. This number one. Right? And then number two saying, okay, here's how we can help you to achieve that dream. And here's how long, like measured expectations. Right, and then say, okay, here are the loopholes. Here is the obstacles, the challenges you're gonna face, and here is how you're gonna you you can get around them. For example, like like one of the things that you look at, say, okay, okay, you've got is it nine or ten provinces? All of those, about three of them, right, have I'll say the most liberal of of the of the pathways for doctors and nurses, right, uh, like New Brunswick and Alberta, especially New Brunswick, right, where they say, okay. While you are abroad, if you do your, your, your NA, like double, NA, double NAS accreditation, your personal test, um, 
we then enroll you in an online program, which is 18 weeks, right? While you're abroad. Mm -hmm. If you pass a test after that, we'll give you provisional registration. Mm -hmm. Then you can use that to apply for your PR card. That will be an easier process for them, right? Exactly. Now, however, for Ontario, they want you to, to be here first before you can start that process. So it's Manitoba and if you're the province. So as you talk to people, as you speak to people um, who have the interest, you explain these. Even if you want to go to Ontario, you can't go there using your qualification. You have to go, you have to, go to NB first before you get there. But that's, that's a different conversation, right? Um, so first of all, get the information to everyone, right? And then explain to them what every province has per, is trying to do per pathway. Right. And then say, okay, based on all of these, right, here's how we can help you um, achieve that dream, right? For example, I, if your goal is to go to Ontario or BC, then here are the goals you have, to, here are the things you have to look into. For example, forget you, you coming as a nurse. Mm. Let's get you to get your English test. Let's get you to write your um, uh, ways exam. Then you do a few short courses through a private career college, right? Then you use those to come in as a healthcare assistant. Then while you're there, you can then start your pathway to nursing, right? So as I said, uh, Part, get the facts out there. And then two, show the people, then measure the expectations, and then based on what they want to do, show them how they can get there and how quickly they can get there without being disappointed. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Henry, so much for shedding the light on this critical issue. Uh, your efforts uh, to bridge the gap for IHPS in Canada are commendable and essential for the strength of our healthcare system. Henry, access to the working capital is pivotal concern for many small business owners, like including me. Like with factoring being a common yet sometimes costly solution, right? Could you discuss the risk and rewards associated? using the factoring for short-term working capital financing? Yeah, um, I, I, I was using factoring too, up to um, um, about six, five months ago, so I know exactly how it functions. I used to, um, um, a, a UK company, BB, uh, when they first came here, they were my, were my factor for a long time before they were sold to someone else. Um, anyways, um, as, as everyone knows, right, you, you need to make payroll. There's no way around it. You need to make, make payroll and, and make pay your rent check and stuff. So, Factoring is um is is uh what's it called a very useful tool. It is um quick, um it's fast, it's flexible, um um also it's less cumbersome. Like uh, they won't ask you to um maintain some profit profit in the margins, leverage this that none of that. They just want the interest. That's it. Uh, so don't don't the rats. It's easy. It's all that stuff. Well, here is the risk though. Um, difficult to get out of it once you're inside it. Mm. Right, and I think the reason why is that uh, I don't know about your business, but in most of our business, our margins are tight. But what factoring gets away from you is understanding its true cost versus your margin. Because if your margin is say fifteen percent, right, you may find that factoring is costing you five or six percent, but you don't know it. Wow. Because you are um, raising invoices and rate making payroll and this, that, and all that stuff, right? You don't realize that almost every, uh, what's he called, every dollar of your own money you're making, you're giving them half of it. And because of that, you're not where you need to be, but you don't know why. You, you see what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. You, you're not looking at the numbers the way you have to be looking at them. Right. And I and, and I I'm I'm saying I'm a CPA, hmm. right? And I've, I've and I've been in this for a long time, right? And it didn't occur to me, <laughs> right? How um um pervasively expensive hmm. it is, despite all the conveniences it gives you, right? Like I did uh, like a quick example of saying an invoice of a thousand dollars, right? Typically you're making um say um. If you're good, one fifty dollars off it. Mm. If you're really good, most times you're making a hundred dollars off that invoice. Sometimes it's fifty mm. or maybe sixty. It depends on client to client and transaction to transaction. Uh, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. But on average, you say ten percent margin on most things. Right. If you you you're so good, fifteen percent, right? But on an invoice like that, it's factored and took ninety days to pay. They take back six percent of it. Right. That means if, if you're doing a ten percent margin, literally. You made four percent, but 
you're not looking at the numbers intrinsically when the money is coming and you're doing the payroll. Right? That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. So one, it's difficult to get off. Mm -hmm. We know it's difficult. Two, there's so many hidden fees that you can't see mm -hmm. for you to 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 basically have um um I'll say holistic view of what your business is doing versus versus what it's supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. and I think that, that and I think that's where it's um as a tool, uh, it's a very risky tool. And I'll say um um I will encourage everyone if you're using it to um every time check your contract versus the fees all the time. The recipe to look at it. Find a friend, whatever you have to do, make sure that whatever they say that that's your contract and here's how much they're charging you, pick up one or two invoices every 30 days. Run it through the contract, make sure that uh, whatever they, they charge you for that bill equals the contract that they gave you. That's very, very important. Right? It is. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Henry, for sharing that valuable advice with our listeners. Like, you now, financial hurdles can be daunting for many small business owners, like especially in the early stage or uh, during the economic downturn that we have seen in 2020. Could you share your insights or advice on managing financial challenges? Well, like, one of them is uh, watch the numbers. Like, like the thing about the factoring, run the bill through, make sure the charging you is what they actually agreed to be charged. And not just for factoring, for just about everything else. Your payroll, look at it. I mean, um, most businesses, your cost of capital, your payroll, that's where most of you, your, like in my business, are uh, uh, people, right? So like 80% of our expenses are in those three. Like the payroll, the cost of being the payroll, Right, plus everything around it. Yeah, that is the so, main cost for any business, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you don't get if you don't get everything around that right, like literally half your margin is gone. Like um, uh, an example. This this are example, right? And I consider myself um above of, of above average financial capabilities, right? But even I, I've, I've been a victim of the things I'm talking about, right? That means. Someone else who doesn't have my technical competencies, right, is going to face a far harder time if they can't find the resources, right? Like, um, uh, like, uh, uh, I checked, I look, 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 look through an assessment of our charges over two years from from one of the factoring companies, and they charged us over and above our contract by by half a million dollars a year, right? But I couldn't, I didn't get to that, right? Before I, I I thought about looking at the bank and saying, look, we are turning over all this money, right? But we're not seeing the cash in our books, and we're not seeing um our so called the margins as we think they are on the on Excel file. What's the problem, right? So uh, what's it called um 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 uh, like I said, the first one, look at your numbers like every time, true, um um um, if you can. Find a bank or something away from factoring, but something close to a bank as you can. As close as you can to get the bank, try to find that. Mm. Right? And then and then I think the third one is um um everyone says this, but um people don't want to live by it. Find a way to live on less. I mean, um I've, I don't think we need too much. Maybe it's just what I brought up. If you find a way to live on less, your business needs a lot less for you to run it. Right? right? Your overhead is low. Right? right? Because Executive compensation is something people are fighting over all the time, right? Okay. Like look at uh, they say the CEO makes ten times the guy who does the work every day. All the, people are fighting over this. Right. I don't have that problem in my office because you know what? I've made I've made it that my compensation reflects the work I do, right? And that um it's also sensitive to everyone who works with me, right? I'm not going to um, for example. Because we made X amount of money by a Bentley or the, no, I, I don't know none of that. One, I it's not like I don't like Bentleys, maybe I do, but it's not my lifestyle to aspire for things that don't add value to me. Right? So once you get the a few of these things figured out, I think you're fine. This is what I think. Like you don't need a bigger house. You don't need um um like five cars, like all these things cost money. Yeah, as you rightly said, Henry, like, you know, financial literacy is very, very important for each and everyone, especially the small business owners. Uh, I, I must say that, like, you know, your experience provides a valuable 
perspective on navigating financial challenges uh, and the transition from factoring to a more sustainable financing model is a significant achievement. Now, Henry, like now let's discuss about the effectiveness of payroll providers, like ensuring accurate payroll, as you said, deduction, uh, payroll deduction is crucial for compliance and the financial well-being of employees and the company. In your experience, Henry, like how effective are payroll providers in managing deductions accurately and what should businesses look in for a good provider? Well, I would say um, we should, as a small business owners, um, and, and, uh, we should be cognizant of like one thing. A payroll provider isn't, isn't a tax advisor. They're a processor. So when you get those two separate, that means that whatever they, they're doing for you, you need to get someone else to look at it. For it's uh, one reasonableness, two accuracy, three, um, uh, what's it called? That is it being applied consistent? Is it being applied par the law? Because most of them, most like here, ADP, so you name it, they they, uh, they they work across many countries. So you find that um, the people they're using for your pay are not even here. So your tax tables, your codes, they don't know none of it. So you punch in the data, you make a calculation based on um, what they think, right, is your situation, and then they proceed. Now, if you don't get your numbers looked at by someone, every year you're over, you're over, you're over uh, deducting, you're over, de and if you over deduct on the employee side, you're on the employer side. Because, because if you do 10%, the government says you do 10% on the guy and 5% on this side. If that 10% is wrong, this is wrong too. Right? right? So you find out that over time, you're a payroll provider. Right, like ADP, NAMI, Ceridian, they've taken all this money from you, giving it to the government that they shouldn't have. And if you don't get your T4 sum re reviewed by a third party to say, okay, you paid 10 people some of the money per the tax table, this is what you should have paid versus D. So you adjust it before you, you, you make a final submission to the government. Yeah, so it's as what you're saying is like making sure the numbers uh, that you're presenting should be correct and uh, they are very important. Yeah. No, Henry, like uh, let's uh, move to like contributing to a just and equitable world. Every business have the power to make significant contributions uh, to a more just and equitable world, right? Like what actions can private uh, like businesses take to foster a more inclusive and equitable society based on your experience and philosophy? Uh, well, uh, my experience as an immigrant, um, 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 all the way I've been, um, obviously I've always been the, 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 that different guy in every room I've been in, right? Um, I was a CPA in England. At the time when, um, uh, what's he called, someone told me there was no space for me in this field. So that to be unique in every way, right? It doesn't have to be like that, right? So um, in today's world, um, um, as we, everyone goes around credit, create, as as we all try to, uh, participate or contribute to a more, to a more just world. Um, um, businesses have um, a significant role to play in that, uh, for example, um, uh, many uh, businesses, uh, both small and large, right, have customers in every part of a facet of the country. That means that um, 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 your staff, right, the people you employ at all levels, sh we should make an effort, make them reflective of, of the, the customers we serve. But you can achieve that if you can't provide opportunities for, for in, at entry level positions for to get in the business. That means um, you, you, like employers or companies have to have a deliberate policy around internships and co-placements, co co right? Where you get enough young people in regardless of where they are, in, regardless of where they are, uh, what's it called in the country, to get into the internship programs within, within, within all the corporations, right? And businesses. Uh, because then what that does is this, uh, it creates for you a large enough pool so that when you start to hire people, Obviously, Eaton's are go they're going to form a portion of your hiring pool. Uh, when I was going, when I when I was starting out in England, the CFM, you found that um, um, all the township students came from certain families. Their parents who are accountants or lawyers. So if your parents were not one of those, you're not going to come in, right. right? Then as you start to move up, you find that the junior partners, senior partners look the same way, right? I don't think today's world should look like the world I came in. I don't think so. Right, and I think businesses have a role to businesses have a role to creating 
that diversity on the corporate table by widening the entry positions through townships and got corporate co-placements and, and like each all the things at, at the bottom, I think they're significant. Yeah, that's right. And now like how your company, Nexim, uh, embody these values in its operations and community engagements? Uh, three things. Well, um, we have a, we have a, um, a country-wide um, um, internship program uh, where we get students from um, um, basically anyone who has um, uh, they've got their SIN number from about fourteen years old when they, as a, when they're fourteen hmm. or above, right? Um, um, and they're doing well in um, high school. I think GCSEs they call it here. Um, they call it levels when I was going to go in school in England. That time when people are starting to find part time employment and all that stuff. Uh, we've got programs across our offices to train them. Um, um, basically, a general office skills, phone skills, customer service skills, they start, they, all that stuff, right? And then um, those who then excel in the program have an option, right, to enroll in our either summer summer program or the winter program where we, uh, because of 24-7, so we have hours on the weekend at night and name it where young people can come in and practice what they learn, supervised, supervised by someone on the team, right? So that's one of them. Two? Um, 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 obviously, as, 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 as someone um, um, who is a minority in finance, I've got a major issue around uh, uh, financial literacy among people who look like me, right? So um, things around the tax code, the mortgages, the credit cards, why you shouldn't get a card at a certain age, and if you're going to get a card, how you should, why, you should, why you should finance it as opposed to paying for it? As opposed to paying for it. And if you're going to pay for it, how you can finance, how you could pay for it, but also write it off. Like these very simple tools to help young people understand money um, um, way ahead of the curve, right? So we've got a financial literacy program that um, um, all our staff and their kids participate in, plus the uh, wider community around all our offices, right? That, that's locally. And then internationally, uh, because obviously I'm of East African parentage and I grew in South Africa, um, through our foundation, we're doing two things, um, um, access to education and wildlife conservation. Um, we're doing a STEM program in South Africa to um, increase access to BIM training. Um, uh, there's a lot of it on our website, on the NIDO community website, um, because South Africa skills are a problem. So our goal is to get this BIM program in as many black kids as possible so they can fight their way out of poverty. And then um, 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 on the East African side, uh, they are a game of survival. People have to pay fees to go to school. No one has the money. So um, um, our program uh, there um, seeks to provide a bus race to 2,500 kids every year. That's great to hear right? that. And these bus races are focused on, um, obviously, one, um, we have an urban, co urban girl poverty intervention program where kids, uh, girls who have been um, um, uh, turned into domestic servants, uh, we provide them access to go to school so they can get out of that. And then... Um, um, we have another program um, um, that is for youth, uh, mainly sports, uh, soccer, athletics, and everything. We've got a special list for people who are good at that to go to school without paying for fees. Um, and then uh, uh, we've got conservation uh, that's focused on primates and, 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 and lions up in, in Western Uganda, where we basically use education plus um, energy efficiency to get people away from the park. So these are the things that uh, we're doing through uh, our foundation and our business to make the world a better place. Uh, thank you so much, Henry, for sharing the initiatives of Nexim. It's it's uh, it's truly fascinating to hear. Now, as we draw this conversation to a close, Henry, like uh, I would like to ask you one final piece of advice for our listeners, especially those who are navigating the early or challenging stages of their ambitious journey. Yeah, I mean, um, um, and, and being an entrepreneur is not a team sport. You're going to be alone most of the time. So you'll be comfortable being alone. This is the one, one thing, right? And then to, um, um, it's a game of persistence of being resilient. You have, you have to do the same thing 50 times before it, before it works out. So you can't give up halfway, right? Um, also, I think uh, what I can say um, from my, my own experience is, um, um, there's nothing to fear but fear. I mean, um, like a cold cold. I never made it a cold cold before I, before I became a business person. No one told me this, right? But when someone says no, it's, it's, it's not the end of the world. People have been saying no to you for a long time. Someone saying no on the phone, who cares, right? So mentally you have to get over no. This is the second one, right? And then the other is that, um, um, yes, it's, it's not a team sport. 
But saying, don't worry if you can find a few people to walk the road, to walk that road with. That's why it could be family, it could be friends. It could be um, um, a support group. Like when I, when I moved here, I didn't know anyone. So I was deliberate in looking for people to help me to build the business I want to build. So I found mentors, right? I literally sought mentors, right? To help me navigate issues, right? Uh, there was a time when, uh, this actually, this, this actually was quite a delicate time. Um, I had a guy um, who was um, one of my first hires who had taught a lot of my business. He nicked half of it, right? And then set up, set up in competition. So went into, into litigation, right? And then it turned into a nasty fight that didn't, what came away from what happened to other things. And also they showed I lost the case and he got a judgment, right? For a quarter million dollars, right? Now here's the problem. Um, when the judgment came through, um, I forget where I was. Anyways, once he got it, normally when they give you a judgment, they give, you, they give the, the, the opposing party time either to pay or, or work out a payment. But also, the person who got a judgment cannot just walk the bank and say, I want money paid, don't get the guy to get in on this. Stop this, this person from using any money in any of his accounts after they get paid. Mm -hmm. Now, if they do that, you can go to court and ask for relief. That's if you have time. So this happened to me, right? I woke up one morning and my payroll, all my accounts are frozen because of this judgment, right? Then I said, how could the guy who stole my business Get away with this. That is a lot fair. Right? And the answer is exactly fair. Right? right? But, as in everything, fairness is not according to how you think. Right? So then I said, okay, I've got a bit of a problem. Right? My payroll is doing two days. But I don't have the money. It's got a million dollars. A lot of money you can't find it within two days. Now, this way, term comes in. Right? I literally thought about taking my own life that day, right? But I met a guy, the guy said, look, my friend, I just lost my kid and I can't stop working because if I, if I stop working, they're going to take my house. That's true. Right? In that moment, I said, okay, I have to go back to my uh, little uh, office, call all my friends and find a quarter million dollars. That's what I have to do. So I picked up the phone, called everyone I know, and I phoned everyone to make my pillow within make my pillow within two days. Right. So that's why I say that find people that get this support group. Ask for help, right? Ask for help, right? And as you do, as you as you you what's it called? Uh, go down the road. You find that um, people are going to help you if you ask, right? Right. And two, like the toughest things you think you're facing, someone has it ten times over. This number one. Number two, your biggest obstacle. Is one phone call away. Like that, that is my pedal. Right? If I don't have it, my business is gone. But in order to get that place, I have to meet this guy in a, on, 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 on an Uber to tell me, you know what, your problem is big, but mine is worse. Right? But then after that, find 10 friends and say, look, if each of you gave me 10,000 in six months, if you're going to get 10% of your money back in six months plus your money, but I'm going to save my business. Right, so by cultivating um uh, what's he called um a team, or or, 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 or like as I said um before, take people with you through the journey. Right, that's that's very that's very very important. And as you rightly said, the most important thing I take uh, from the entrepreneurs that I had discussion with in my previous years is asking for help is very very important. Yeah. And you know like. Uh, uh, also, we, uh, everyone need to understand the bend of the road is not the end of the road. No. Know? Like, yeah. And uh, Henry, like, it was a great pleasure to sit with you and discuss about your entrepreneurial journey. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your valuable insights and your experiences with me and with our audience. Thank you for having me. Thank you. In today's Canadian SME Small Business Podcast, a big thank you to Henry Lukenge for his invaluable insights on integrating health professionals into Canadian healthcare, financial growth strategies, and payroll compliance. Henry's journey from immigrant to healthcare staffing leader exemplifies resilience and innovation, proving challenges can be transformed into opportunities for impactful contributions.
Thanks to our partners RBC, UPS, Zero, and Constant Contact for their support. For more inspiring stories and tips, visit CanadianSME.ca. Let's Henry's story motivate you to tackle obstacles, chase your dreams, and make a difference. Until our next episode, support local, innovate, and contribute to a sustainable future. See you next time for the Canadian SME Small Business Podcast.